We were uh, talking about kindness this morning. Before we dive into the message, let me introduce myself. If you're new this morning, my name is Adam. I'm the pastor here. And really, honestly, what a privilege it is if you're new, uh, you've chosen to worship with us today. Um, Man, my prayer for you today is that you encounter the Holy Spirit, his life-changing presence, and that you experience the love of Jesus through our community and our church family. And we're really just so excited that you're here. Uh, Like I said, we're talking about kindness today. We're in this series entitled Low-Hanging Fruit, Low-Hanging Fruit, and we're looking at Galatians chapter 5. I want to start off by giving you a definition of low-hanging fruit. Uh, We read this last week. I want to read it again. It's this, easy things that can be most readily done or dealt with in achieving success or making progress towards an objective. So... As followers of Jesus, we should easily live out the fruit of the Spirit. We should easily live out love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. If we're attached to the vine, if we're spending time with him, but what happens a lot in our relationship with the Lord is We'll fix our eyes on the complexity of walking out our spiritual gifts versus just being attached to the giver of every good and perfect gift, resulting in a shallow relationship with a loving father. And this series really is all about just staying attached to, to the vine, spending time with Jesus, and then we're, we can easily live out the fruit of a spirit which is easily and readily attainable for every single believer. Here's the thing about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is a person. He's, he's, not, he's not weird. He's not spooky. He's not awkward. He's not any of those things. And many people believe, man, the Holy Spirit's weird. I don't want anything to do with him. But this list of the fruit of the Spirit is actually the characteristics of the Holy Spirit. He is love. The Holy Spirit is joy. The Holy Spirit is peace. Patience, and what we're talking about this morning, he is kindness. And so if we spend time with him every single day, we can't help but to reflect him, yeah? The people you spend time with on a regular basis, you'll end up being like him, like them. If we spend time with the Holy Spirit, we're going to end up being like the Holy Spirit and be a reflection of these gifts. Really, it's singular, the gift. The gift of the Holy Spirit. Let's read Galatians chapter 5 this morning. It says this, verse 22, "But but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, or envying one another. So let's talk about the fruit of kindness this morning. But before we do, um, let's pray and just invite the Holy Spirit to speak to us this morning. Holy Spirit, you are love, you are joy, you are peace, you are patience, you are kindness, God. You are goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And Lord, our hearts and our desires is that, God, that we would live out who you are in your personality, Jesus. That, God, we, you would teach us, God, how to have eyes to see people with compassion and love and kindness, God. Lord, you were so incredibly kind. And Lord, would you make us reflections to this world of your personality, Jesus. Lord, I pray that today, God, that my words would be few, but Lord, you would just fill my mouth, God, with what you want to say, with what you want to speak, with what you want to do this morning, God. No one came in this place, God, to hear from me. Holy Spirit, we all came to hear from you. And so, God, would you take your logos word, your written word, and would you make it rhema to us, God? 
Would you make it alive in our hearts, God? Some of these things that we've talked about before, we might have heard before, Jesus. Maybe it might be the first time hearing it, Lord, but you would make it alive in us so that we might live it out, God, because we don't want to just be hearers of the word, but, Lord, we want to be doers, Jesus. So we surrender to you, and we ask for you to speak, God, for your servants are listening today. In Jesus' mighty and incredible name, and everyone said, amen, amen. amen. When I was in my uh, mid-20s serving at my uh, first church I was on staff at in uh, Somerville, South Carolina, which is about 35 minutes away from, from Charleston, I was at the time uh, a young adults pastor, but also uh, a worship pastor as well. I was leading worship probably three, four times a week and, and also pastoring 60 to 80 uh, college students uh, every single week. And it was an incredibly busy time, but also a wonderful time as well. And as we begin to pastor these, these students, uh, the Lord just kind of dropped in myself and, my, and Laura's heart to be the hands and feet in G, of Jesus to these college students and to teach them to do it as well. And so in Somerville, you know, there really wasn't a tangible need that were, it was just known like right in front of your face. And so what we, what we did is we would uh, pack up like chicken alfredo or spaghetti in these little containers and we'd take them to downtown Charleston and we'd feed the homeless there with these college students. And it was a really incredible time where the Lord is beginning to break our hearts for the people, God, the people who were less fortunate, the people who were in need. And so the Lord was really dealing with us on that, and there came an opportunity for us to move to to Jacksonville, to a church that was in the Arlington area, and begin to minister there. And so if you don't know the Arlington area, there's some neighborhoods and some pockets that, man, the need is so tangible. The the people there in certain neighborhoods and certain places are, are, are struggling, and the need was just right in front of your face and evident. And so when the opportunity came for us to do that, uh, also because it was a smaller church, and like I said, I was leading worship three, four times a week, and it was very busy. Laura was seven months pregnant. We made the move down here to Jacksonville. You can imagine just how crazy that move was while Laura was seven months pregnant. Like, it was just crazy. I don't recommend ever doing that, y'all. Don't ever do that. Don't, don't move while you're moving. Is it moving like one of the, the worst hard things to do? Like, it's just, man... So we moved down here, and I'm really passionate, and I'm, I'm, I'm gun o. I'm like, man, Lord, I, I'm, I'm so excited about helping these people and, and reaching not only their spiritual needs, but their physical needs as well. And it was an incredible opportunity to do that at this church. And I remember leaving uh, work one day and meeting someone in the parking lot, and this man tells me, you know, we... I don't know how I'm going to make my bills. Uh, my family doesn't have any, have any food and, and all this. And so I'm like, man, I, I would love to help you. So I, I take him to the grocery store. We buy about $80 worth of groceries. And uh, I, I go to his house. And for whatever reason, he kind of had his, his door already cracked open. And as we're taking his groceries to the front door, he says, hey, hold, hold, hold on. Don't, just leave the groceries right there. And I was like, no, it's no big deal. I'll just drop them off inside. And so I open the door, and what I see is there are already groceries everywhere. And in my heart, you might be saying, Adam, why are you telling this story when you're talking about kindness? I'll get to it in a second. In my heart, I think to myself, dude, like I'm helping you out, and I'm going over over and above, and you don't really need the help. Like you've already hit someone up for all this, it looks like. I'm thinking that myself. I don't say anything. I help them unload the groceries, drop them off. And I'll tell this story because you might have experienced this personally in your own life or you've heard a story like this. You just, you just heard a story now. And we can respond one of two ways or actually three ways. We can respond to a story like this, a situation like this with a heart and heart where we're not going to help anybody ever again. We're not going to be kind. We're not going to, if we see a need, we're just going to be like, hey, that's their problem, not mine. Or you can look and you can help someone but do it reluctantly, right? Maybe not really have complete compassion towards them or kindness, and you might help them because you feel like it's a religious duty of yours because you're a follower of Jesus. Or you can say, I'm going to reject my flesh. And what my flesh is saying in a situation And I'm going to exercise the spirit of God that lives within me 
and be the fruit of the Spirit and act kindly towards people regardless of what might happen, regardless of if I feel like they're taking advantage of me or not. I'm not talking about not being smart, whatever, but what I'm talking about is we need to be people despite a circumstance that might have happened in our life to still care about the welfare of others. Amen? And for me that day, if I'm honest with myself, it took me a while to get out of category two. It took me a while to get out of category two where I was skeptical of other people and I might have helped them out, but I was helping them out reluctantly. But here's the thing, we should be concerned for the welfare of others and do all we can to be kind to them, even if we are taken advantage of. Because here's the thing, Matthew chapter 25, right? Jesus says, Whatever you do unto the least of these brothers of mine, you have done unto me. We look at people regardless of the situation. We say, man, that is Jesus out there hurting. If you take that verse seriously, if you take that verse literally, that is Jesus. The fact that there is potential for people to use us to be dishonest with us must never prevent us from doing acts of kindness. We are, to be, we are to see deeper than the potential for manipulation and deceit. We must see their need because that's what Jesus said to do. Jesus said in Luke 6, 35, 36, but love your enemies, do good, and lend, hoping for nothing in return, and your reward will be great. And you will be sons of the Most High, for he is kind to the unthankful and evil. Therefore, be merciful be merciful, just as your Father also is merciful. Jeremiah 9, 24, I am the Lord, exercising loving kindness. Psalm 86, 5, for you, Lord, are good and ready to forgive and abundant in mercy. Romans 2, 4, God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance. God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance. God's kindness is intended to lead people to repentance. Just, just think about that verse for a moment. When you go and you do an act of, of random act of kindness towards someone, it can lead someone to Jesus. We, sh we should never resist the urge that the Holy Spirit puts inside of us to meet someone's needs. But not only that, think about maybe a parent. Think about someone else in your life that you've been trying to convince that they need to be a follower of Jesus or beat them over the head with, hey, this is, this is what the Bible says about this or that. You see, it's not going to be your brow beating. It's not going to be you convincing someone to be a follower of Jesus. What's going to be? It's going to be the kindness of the Lord inside of you being reflected to others. That is what's going to lead people to repentance. Amen? So how do you see a loved one come to Jesus who doesn't know him? Kindness, not being smarter than they are. Romans eleven twenty two, 22. It says this. Note then the kindness and the severity of God. Severity towards those who have fallen, but God's kindness to you, provided you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you will be cut off too. That's a very serious verse right there, isn't it? Here's my point with all this. We should never resist the urge to be kind. We should never resist the urge to extend kindness to others. The Greek word for kindness is this, krestos. Krestos means the ability to act for the welfare of those taxing your patience. We talked about patience last week. The ability to act for the welfare of those taxing your patience. Jack Hayford, uh, one of my... Uh, favorite theologians, uh, he, write this, he writes this about this fruit of the Spirit. He says this, it's goodness in action, sweetness of disposition, and gentleness in dealing with others, benevolence, kindness, and affability. As you walk through your day, are you concerned about listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit as he prompts you to be kind to others, kind to family members, neighbors, coworkers? and all others with whom you come in contact with. As Christians, we are to be known as Crestos people. Those who know us should be able to testify that we are kind. 
I want to read now the, the parable of the Good Samaritan, and I want to give you three things from this parable, but first let me give you some context. A Pharisee comes to Jesus, and he asks Jesus' this question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus replies back to him, well, what does the law say? He knows in that moment that this is a religious man, and he wants to find out the do's and don'ts and follow the law, and that this is th- he thinks that's what's going to give him eternal life. And Jesus replies back, and the Pharisee replies back to him, well, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and, will, and love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus tells the man, yes, that's exactly right. That's how you receive eternal life. And then the man replies back, well, well Jesus, who is my neighbor? You see in that moment, he's like, hey, is my neighbor next door? Is my neighbor across the street? Like he's trying to find out who is his neighbor and who he needs to help to have eternal life. But it's not religious or law that's going to get us to heaven, is it? It's going to be the grace of God. And Jesus, in his wisdom, tells this story to him. Jesus, uh, Luke 10.30, then Jesus answered and said, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, and departed leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a certain priest came down that road. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Verse 32. Likewise, a Levite, when he arrived at the place, came and looked and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. When he saw him, he had what? Say it out loud again. Compassion. So he went to him, bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, and he set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. On the next day when he departed, he took out two denarii, which is money for that day and time, gave them to the innkeeper, and said to him, take care of him. Whenever more you spend, when I come again, I will repay you. So which of these three do you think was neighbor to him who fell among the thieves. Jesus asked the question. The Pharisee replied back and he said, he who showed mercy on him. Then Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. Go and do likewise. So I want to give you three things from this parable that we can learn from this morning. Number one, number one, kindness is full of compassion. Kindness is full of compassion. How do we respond when we see others in need? As Christians, we are supposed to be full of compassion when we see others in need. It is an emotion that fills our heart. And as we are led by this compassion, it can make a difference in other people's lives. This past, uh, this past week, there was a, an event at where my wife works. Um, she works at Mercy Support, which if you haven't heard of Mercy Support, they provide affordable housing to those who are in need uh, and those who are under uh, circumstances outside of their control. And she's been working there since, uh, since COVID hit, kind of helping people out. And, um, and, and just she has a, such a compassionate heart. And a man there and his family was telling a story, and he was just saying, you know, if it wasn't for mercy and, and the help, Um, that they provide that, you know what, during that season of COVID, I wouldn't be able to meet bills. I wouldn't be able to provide for my family and all this kinds of stuff. And they said that my wife, I just want to brag on if it's okay. My wife, she went over and beyond what she could, what was necessary to meet their needs. And I have to tell you, why did she do that? Because she has a heart of compassion. A heart of compassion will lead you to go over and beyond when you see someone in need. When you have an opportunity to meet a need, you will go over and beyond because of your compassion. Many people in this room journey, we're a compassionate church. Many people in this room have a heart of compassion, but what if we took our compassion and went to even a different level in our compassion, our ability to be kind, our ability to love, our ability to meet other people's needs? The Samaritan saw the man and his heart was moved with compassion. This is a reflection and illustration of Jesus and how he sees people as well. In Mark 141, in the middle of a crowd of hungry, tired people, Jesus heard the cry of a leprous man. He was full of compassion. Matthew 9, 36, when Jesus looked at a busy city full of people going in a thousand directions, he saw them as harassed, 
helpless sheep without a caring shepherd, and he felt compassion towards them. Luke 7, 13, when he saw the funeral uh, procession of the son of, of the widow, he was moved with her tremendous sorrow, and his compassion came over Jesus. You see, Jesus was not detached, distant, or indifferent to the pain he saw in people's lives. People were not a hindrance. People were not a nuisance or a bother to him. Rather, he saw their need and the opportunity to help them. So there's three people in this story of the Good Samaritan. Three people that Jesus tells about. He talks about the priest. He talks about the Levite. He talks about the Samaritan. The priest. The priest quickly went by the man that was wounded on the road. Why? I'm sure he was thinking of the scripture in Numbers where it says, if you touch Someone who is dead, you're unclean for seven days. He was thinking that man might be dead. If I go touch him, then I'm not going to serve in the temple. In that moment, he was putting religion over the opportunity to help people. He was thinking to himself, I care more about ceremony than I do charity. He was putting religion above everything else in that moment and stopped helping that man. The Levite, the Levite comes and he sees the man and he's thinking to himself, okay, that road that he was traveling on, it was a dangerous road. And when you saw someone, there was, there was likely at, at different times, there was uh, the bandits who would come and who would attack people on that road. And so what the Levite was thinking, you know what, I got to keep going because I might, something might happen to me. He was thinking in that moment, I mean, safety first. I got to be safe. I got to take care of myself, right? But the Samaritan, he saw the man, his heart was moved with compassion. You know, the difference between the two religious people and the Samaritan was this. They asked the question, the two religious people, what might happen to me if I help them? What's going to happen to me if I help them? When the Samaritan asked the question, what might happen to that person if I help them? You see, the opportunity when you see someone in need, to change someone's life. That's what, how we need to see it and think about, not our own selves, right? Compassion isn't about you. It's about giving all the love that you have to others. Amen? It's not about us. It's about giving all the love that we have to other people. We must listen to the Holy Spirit and act on his promptings to be kind as the Holy Spirit fills us with his compassion for others. This leads to the next point. Kindness takes action. Kindness takes action. The Good Samaritan not only had compassion for the injured traveler, he decided to do everything he could to assist the man. He took action. What did he do? He bandaged his wounds. He put them on a donkey. He put him in an inn, took care of him. He gave money to the innkeeper to take care of him. Paul wrote this in Colossians 3.12. Put on then, notice that phrase, put on. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Kindness, like the other fruit of the Spirit, is something that we put on daily. It is when we come before the Lord and we spend time with him and we reflect the nature, the personality of God and we also make the the personal deliberate choice, the deliberate choice to extend kindness to others. And in extending kindness to others, not only are we talking about this morning kindness to people that we don't know, we're also talking about family members, right? (laughs) Maybe it's a spouse. You need to extend kindness to them. I think a lot of marriages would be saved if we just learned to extend more kindness to our spouse. Amen? Or how about a son or daughter who is struggling? Maybe they're struggling in school. Or maybe in their life they made a terrible mistake and they're now in jail or something else. that is. It's not a time to withdraw in their situation. What is it? It's a time to extend kindness towards them. Extend love towards them. Extend compassion towards them. 
Because when we live, develop a lifestyle of showing kindness in our homes, we will be more apt to consider ways to show kindness to those in our community, in our church, in our workplace. We must allow our compassion to lead us to action. Because when we take action, it is powerful. Which leads me to point three. Kindness is powerful. Kindness is powerful. Kindness is powerful. In our dog-eat-dog competitive world, many people view kindness as weakness. Those who demonstrate kindness go against the stream of this callousness and insensitivity in society. But a truly great person shows his greatness by the way he extends kindness towards others. Hmm. When Paul wrote to Timothy about the characteristics of godly leaders, he said, 2 Timothy 2.24, the Lord's servant must not quarrel. Instead, he must be kind to who? Kind to, come on, y'all, say it a little louder, y'all. Wake out there, kind to everyone. Kind people are sensitive to others' needs. Philippians 2.4 tells us, we let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also the interests of others. Sensitivity of others' interests is a tremendous strength that we can develop. We all have people around us who are hurting. We are to be sensitive to their pain, listen to them, pray for them, and just be there for them when they need the help. Your encouragement may be the thing that motivates them to do the right thing. Proverbs 15.4 tells us the tongue that brings healing is a tree of life, but a deceitful tongue crushes the spirit. Listen to this. Kind words do not cost much, yet they accomplish much. Kind words do not cost much, yet they accomplish much. When we look for opportunities to say something nice, kind, and truthful, when you say something like that, Something nice, kind, and truthful. I mean, it lifts someone's spirits, doesn't it? It makes a difference in their life. It gives them the ability to continue on. When we say something nice, kind, but it's not truthful, it's just empty words. When we say something rude, man, it breaks someone's spirit. But man, when we say something nice, kind, and truthful to the person, man, it can give them the ability, the energy to keep going, to keep pushing forward. Kind people look for opportunities to show kindness despite a busy schedule. They will slow down to help. And when you think about this, the Samaritan, I guarantee you, man, he had somewhere to go, didn't he? He was on a mission. He was traveling the road to go. But the Holy Spirit in that moment, he interrupted him. What if we allow the Holy Spirit to interrupt our schedules at times to help people? What about just in our life, allow the Holy Spirit to speak to us in moments when we're busy, when we're rushing around? But if we were able just to be present, be aware of what the Holy Spirit is speaking in every single situation, then we will have eyes to see those who are hurting, those who are in need. Because literally, those who are hurting and in need, if you look at Matthew 25, that's literally what he says Whatever you did unto the least of these brothers of mine, you've done unto me. May our hearts be full of compassion that leads to action. And when we take action, it's powerful. It's powerful. You never know that when you make a difference in someone's life, just a small act of kindness, just a random act of kindness, what ripple effect that might have in their life in their legacy, in their family, what it might have in your own life as well. It is powerful. It is powerful when we act kind towards other people. If you would bow your heads and close your eyes this morning. In this moment, I want to ask you to ask God to help you to be kind.